Greetings sailors and welcome to Supporter Spotlight number whatever this is, 37 I believe. As you might surmise this is going to be an all warships edition and we're going to start off with Tugboat 1964 in the Dunkirk. Now I've picked out this time around a battleship game, a, a cruiser game and we're going to finish off with a destroyer game so there's a, a nice variety going on but there is going to be kind of a theme kind of and the theme is going to be things happening in a very awkward fashion and yet somehow still working out and you will see what I mean I think for each of the replays but for this one in particular you can maybe start to guess just from the fact that it's the Dunkirk and it has those forward facing turrets and so when you're driving around in the Dunkirk the, the configuration of the ship really, really dictates what you can do with the thing. It's the same with the, the, the Izumo. And a lot of the time you want to, to be keeping in motion if you can, because sitting still obviously makes you vulnerable to torpedoes and um, if there are carriers around, it makes you a very attractive target because they will usually, not always, but they'll usually know that you don't have particularly good AA. But in this case, there aren't any destroyers nearby that he knows of. And so he is able to sit here relatively unmolested, because there's also none of the enemy battleships here as of yet, although it looks like there's a Bayern he heading in this direction. And the reason that's important with the Dunkirk, of course, is because the uh, bow armour is particularly vulnerable to being overmatched by War Spite, the Bayern, and of course the Mutsu will definitely fall in that category as well. So he's able to just sit here, back up a bit, and pelt shells downrange at these cruisers. Now not all of his allies are content to do that. The Atlanta's charging in, as is the Koenig. Would it have been a good idea for Tugboat to do the same here? Well, it would have. I mean, if he'd angled towards the cruisers, it would have made him very, very vulnerable to the Bayern and the New York that are also on this side as the Atlanta and that Koenig are finding out. So this is one of those times when in a battleship, in any battleship, you have to really think about the angles of incoming fire. You have to think about how you're going to get out of there if you need to get out of there. And of course in the Dunkirk in particular, that means you're not necessarily going to be able to shoot at them as you're running away, which puts you at a tremendous disadvantage. So he's holding his distance and trying to uh, do the damage that he can. And the the advantage with uh, this situation is, although it turns out there is a destroyer nearby, but it's not particularly threatening him, and uh, he has got a cruiser next to him as well. So it's not necessarily a bad idea to hold position at this point. It isn't necessarily also what I would have done in the Dunkirk myself, but uh, I don't think this is a, a misplay at all. So looking at the rest of the mini-map, they've got the A point, um, having tried to contest B, uh, the enemy team just brought too much firepower to bear, I mean, there is a Graf Spee and a Budioni kind of hovering around to their east as well, but uh, it's not really looking like it's going to be safe to cap B without getting molested by the remaining enemy destroyer, and C, well... I mean, you could try at this point, but it might be a bit tricky getting there because uh, there's still these enemy battleships. Talking of battleships, that's the New York firing at him. There's also the uh, Bayern, who's just popped up fairly close to the Graf Bay, and that just leaves that uh, destroyer who's not been spotted in a little while. So obviously he's somebody to worry about. So the New York, at least, his armour will work against those guns, but only if he's reasonably well angled. I mean, if he times his turn wrong, he could get punished hard just because of the sheer number of guns. But he manages to complete the turn, and so uh, he can hopefully set himself up for a nice broadside shot on this Bayern. Now, although it does have the smallest guns at this tier, um, the, the firepower of the Dunkirk when you can get around that awkwardness is actually pretty reasonable. The penetration is very good on these. So, even though, obviously, the Bayern has got that uh, strong turtle back arrangement, he's easily able at this range to finish him off. 
That was a bit of a, a risky drive-by from the Graf Spee, but it paid off, and between them they've taken out quite a dangerous enemy ship. So at the moment they're looking rather on the up and up. It's 430 points to 157 on the enemy team. They've also got more kills, and this is just looking like a quite a comfortable win at this point. The chat, by the way, I mean, I maybe should mention the chat. Um, it might be entertaining for some people. I, I don't tend to comment on what's going on in the chat in too much, but uh, this is a game where everybody was feeling a bit chatty. So, the Ognavoy has uh, taken a bit more damage, but he's managed to get away with his life. The Graf Spey that capped C is also uh, making an appearance at this point. He doesn't really have to watch uh, 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 think about torpedoes uh, from that guy because uh, the firing angles would have been um, not favourable. If he was going the other way, the Graf Spey might have tried to, to drop torps on him, but uh, as it was, it was fine. So, the Ognavoy pops out again. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, He's not got a lot of health, he's got very short range torps, he's maybe just trying to make a run for it, but he does not succeed. The enemy Spey, it, it does look like he had put out torps himself by the way, which uh, I think... I'm not sure if any, any of them actually connected with the Miyoko, but some of them may have. So at this point, um, Tugboat made a decision to go and cap, and it may in retrospect have been the wrong one. Now. Normally you would want a destroyer to go and do this. They do have one left alive, but as you can see, we've skipped ahead a little bit. Um, what's left of the enemy team kind of consolidated around C, and then they've gone Arizona over towards A. And their own team was sufficiently damaged and fragmented that they have quite significantly evened the odds. And if Tugboat had been there in the middle, because these are not particularly high health enemies either. The Graf Spey's, uh, if he was showing broadside, he'd be quite an easy one shot. The New York's not looking too healthy either. If Tugboat had been there to, uh, to uh, bring his firepower to bear instead of being hidden behind the rocks in C, and it wasn't even for that long, but it was long enough, this could have been a much more comfortable situation, but instead uh, it swung back in the enemy team's favour. And that's one of the things I like about World of Warships in an odd way, is that you can never be that complacent, because even though it might look like something is... Uh, it might look like a, a battle is going well, and you can look at a certain point and think, oh, that's all right. <laughs> oh, that was a nice uh, that was a nice result out of that salvo. Um, quite often, you, uh, I don't know, you see a team getting overconfident or people just all split up and do their own thing. They go off one by one or maybe there's a lot of people left alive but they're all low health and they get picked off by a high, high health enemy that can absorb the, the shots. So uh, there's a there's a, a kind of a... I'm, I'm, I'm sure I made this, uh, this awful attempt at a pun before, that, but there's a fluidity to the <laughs> battles in World of Warships that uh, it, it can keep you on your toes. Maybe even more so than World of Tanks. So, the Arizona, talking of high health people mopping up, the Arizona who doesn't have any kills. I mean, Tugboat's on four now himself. Uh, oh no, actually, that's not true. He's got one kill. Um, he is now capping A. He's got lots of hit points, which is bad news. Uh, the Graf Spey's been able to heal a bit, and uh, Tugboat's actually resorted to some HE to try and take out this guy. There's also Belfast up there who... I mean, the Budioni was very passive. He's quite healthy and he's finally pushing in and doing something, but um, he's trying to make a torpedo pass and he just got citadeled by that Belfast a lot. So he did take out the Belfast, but lost a lot of hit points in the process. Uh, so he, he was... Um, hanging back for quite a long time and when he did finally spring in and make his move I mean he got the kill but uh, he took a heck of a lot of damage in the process and I'm sure maybe a more cautious approach with a more angled approach that didn't involve giving your broadside to a, a Belfast at close range he might be looking at a lot more healthy at this point. So two versus two they can take out the Graf Spey uh, that's actually the firepower of the Graf Spey is not that dangerous, but uh, with the, the torpedo angles in particular, um, if you could stay alive and the, the fact that, that the, the shells the tugboat's firing might struggle, 
you know, if he was firing AP, might struggle to pen the Grafsch Bay. If he can get close enough to dump his torps in the water, then uh, it, it can be a, a very nasty ship to try and dodge, because you can you can use both launches, essentially, with without that much manoeuvring. However, Tugboat was firing HE, which wore him down a little bit, and he's gone back to AP for that salvo, and then he's going back to HE for the, the next salvo. Um, he can't really be afraid of using HE uh, in the, the, the Dunkirk, and I, I will say it's also a ship that... Um, uh, I mean, all ships benefit from the, um, is it Adrenaline Rush? I can't remember. The, the one that means all your armament reloads speed up as you uh, get lower in health. But with the, the Dunkirk in particular, um, because you can expect to lose a lot of health, then uh, it's one that does partic work particularly well. So he takes out the, uh, the, uh, the Grafsch Bay, who did dump uh, torps in the water, but I mean... Tugboat knew it was coming and wiggled around accordingly. This thing, it's not the best in a turn. It's not going to uh, turn on the spot like the Warspite or the Arizona or the, the New Mex will. But still, um, it was able to dodge rather neatly. And now it's come down to one versus one. Now, the fact that it's a US ship with a 14-inch guns means his arm is actually worth a damn. If it had been a Warspite or the Bayern, he'd be getting overmatched through the bow, especially as he's sat dead on towards this guy but as it is the Arizona is uh, especially at this range is going to have to be content with superstructure pens or HE but that goes both ways um, Tugboat himself is having to go with HE and so this is the part where the fight just turns super awkward two bow on battleships just firing back and forth at each other now at this point, the enemy team are ahead enough on points that uh, running away was not an option. He would have to cap, but obviously he can't because he's getting shot at and reset, uh, or else he has to, to kill this guy to win. So he really doesn't have any choice but to deal with this Arizona, and he makes the... I'm no, I don't know that I would have done this, but he really does not want to give broadside to the Arizona. And so instead of going forwards, trying to outrun the the the, the turn of the, the Arizona's turrets, and the Arizona does not have particularly fast firing turrets, um, then yes, he'd run the risk of, of taking a broadside, which could be fatal, um, but he would himself then um, be able to use his much superior speed and uh, also get some shots into the belt armor himself but as it is um yeah now he's got a couple of things going for him his reverse speed's not too bad the arizona is not a fast ship i mean it goes what 20 point something knots 20 and a half knots forwards Tugboat's got 12.1 going backwards so he can make the uh, the arizona um, have to spend half as long trying to get to him as if he was stationary, which is, you know, uh, extra time that he can then shoot at this guy. And at this point, he really does have to rely on the, the high fire chance and just the HE damage. And he's basically trying to burn this guy out as if it was in a cruiser. The big risk, of course, is that the Arizona decides to ram, but... That is a lose-lose scenario. That would result in a draw because the last two ships ramming each other, you know, you're both dying at the same instant. The game goes, well, it's a draw. And so <laughs> we've ended up with this where Tugboat does not want to expose his side armor, where the Arizona doesn't especially want to expose his side armor either. Doesn't have the speed to outmaneuver Tugboat, but he's clearly, you know, figured out that tugboat doesn't want to go forwards either so he's able to uh he's actually playing against tugboat's um reload and although tugboat has got the better reload uh, the fact that tugboat is firing he i mean if you, if you find a battleship that's consistently firing he you can do what the arizona was doing and expose the side to get your rear turrets on and that is an island behind you by the way tugboat so um even though Ordinarily, that would be a bit risky. 
he was fairly confident that, that Tugboat would still have HE loaded, and so uh, he was able to get those guns around. But just the, this, this is the point where the, the extra rate of fire has become really telling, that Tugboat still has, um, what, 40%, 45% of his health left, and at this point, they're going past each other on the broadside, and um, the Arizona won't have his guns loaded, so... There we go, the secondary is actually opening up on the Dunkirk, finally, because they're all in a really awkward rear arc on this ship, and this is, this is it, this is going to be the kill. So, that was just the most awkward, weird ending to a battleship fight I think I've ever seen, and it really only could come about as a result of being in the Dunkirk versus one of the US battleships, or maybe the Fuso as well, actually, although the Fuso's faster. There's, there's definitely less of a speed gap, but it's the fact that it was a US battleship with the US battleship speed that really made the difference there, because it gave Tugboat the extra time to just wear the guy down, as if he was playing a cruiser. So, uh, <laughs> it wasn't an ideal game. It absolutely wasn't an ideal game, but in the end, any game you walk away from, right? So, for the uh, damage he managed to do, which was actually pretty reasonable for a tier 6 uh, battleship in a tier 7 game, and uh, the XP that he got, nearly 2,000 base XP, uh, he also got a, a nice fat packet of credits there, over 400k, which, again, is not bad for a tier 6 battleship. Next up, we have Fog Battleship in Carolina in the Tier 9 British Cruiser. And if that name is familiar, it's because I've featured one of his replays before, and I think not that long ago either. But he's now appearing in the uh, Supporter Spotlight series because he's a recent subscriber, supporter, I don't know what to call it exactly, to uh, my Patreon page. And so we'll start to see more of his replays coming in from now on. So he's a, a fairly capable player, um, he usually sends around games with um, quite impressive damage scores and this game is going to be no exception. But again there will be that element of awkwardness. Now the ship itself, I can't say that much about it, it's um, obviously uh, got a slightly easier to pronounce name than the tier 10, there's a little less question over how one might say it. I mean, obviously it's pronounced Neptunny, obviously. Um, yeah, that joke was bad even in my head. I don't know why I did that, but I did, and it's out there now, and it's done, and you're all probably furiously hitting the unsubscribe button. But on the other hand, I'm sure that's not the worst joke I've ever come out with, so anyway. But yeah, fast firing, AP, smoke, hydro, and uh, a heal. So, not so different from the Minotaur, or possibly Minotaur. Uh, um, but in this case, the uh, probably the major difference is it's tier 9 and he's top tier. So there's no nasty tier 10 um, battleships or tier 10 destroyers or Zows or anything like that to deal with. So a lot of this game is going to be focused around the B cap, and on this map, that is probably the most important cap point overall, because if you can hold the B cap and then either of the ends, you're putting the onus on the enemy team. In this case, however, the onus is definitely on their team. They've captured B, but there's a heavy presence of the enemy around A, and there's also a heavy amount of contesting going on of the C cap. There's actually quite a lot of the uh, uh, ships that spawned on the, the, the southern part of the map seems to be loitering around this area and just exchanging fire across the middle. And they've already lost three ships now, so there's a bit of a points deficit, but nothing catastrophic, especially not at this early stage. However, sometimes these kinds of deficits can then snowball just because you have less firepower available. So they've given up contesting A, there's a, a Scharnhorst up there that's probably not going to last that much longer. Um, and Carolina's smoke having run out, uh, he is able to then just pop into the smoke of the Edinburgh behind him who had uh, been using his smoke previously. And that's going to be a heavy theme of this uh, particular game, is also the use of smoke, but that's what you do with the British cruisers because um, they don't do so well 
dancing around out in the open. It's not like these are uh, Russian destroyers. So that Scharnhorst is showing lovely broadsides right now, so that's a good solid target to go for. He's also burning, so uh, losing lots of health in the meanwhile. And if they can take him out, well, that's a battleship's worth of points back over to their own side. Now, that's quite an arc on these shells, and that's true for the uh, uh, the Minotaur and, and I think most of the British cruisers as well. They've got quite floaty shells, so he's needing to give quite a lot of lead here. And obviously it's easier against a, a battleship that's just going along broadside, but that does make life a lot trickier when you're trying to hit uh, really anything other than quite close ranges. Cruisers that are, are wiggling around or even faster battleships that are doing their best to wiggle around, which that enemy battleship really wasn't. So the Nagato that was here has gone down. There's still an Iowa here and uh, his own division mate in the... Uh, is that another Iowa? I can't remember. I think it's another Iowa has um, decided to push around in the, the north of the, the B-cap and I think he's trying to put some pressure on C because they've got some ships north of C and then they've got his division mate sort of in the middle between B and C. So hopefully they can pincer the enemy ships in B, uh, in C rather, but it doesn't seem like it's going that well. Meanwhile, the enemy destroyer popped up and was promptly dealt with. There's also a Fiji who has uh, appeared at this uh, moment coming up from sea as well. But the enemies that were at sea, I mean, they're kind of congregated down there in a blob. And oh, that was a big hit. Um, but they, they're they pushing up in a very scattershot fashion. They're not pushing up as a solid blob of firepower, which is... That could have been very dangerous. And instead, um, with them being a bit more fragmented with them just pushing in not quite one by one but they're not sticking together and they're not particularly focusing down targets and so with the ability to sit here in smoke and especially now the uh, destroyer threat is gone and that's one thing especially with with uh, using smoke in a British cruiser um, just any smoke cloud is a, a, a big torp me sign and um, if there's not many destroyers around that makes life a lot easier and with all those destroyers having died, that is easy, even easier still. Now, there might still be some cruisers around with uh, torps, but none close enough by to be a worry. I don't think the Fiji was in range either. In fact, this position here is, is not bad all round, because with the little islands of this uh, atoll, uh, I, I think it's supposed to be an atoll anyway, um, that are uh, sort of screening the cap, uh, it makes dropping torpedoes a bit tricky if, if somebody is able to just use the, the shadow, as it were, of the island to uh, shield themselves from torps. So that Degrussa has been scared off. They've got Nibuki all the way in the south. Um, he's not worth chasing after. That would be a waste of time. Um, if you see somebody doing this, uh, unless it's absolutely vital that you go and kill them because you need the points. Uh, generally speaking, you can ignore players that, that charge off into the corner and do these massive wide flanking maneuvers. Now, I think in the case of that Ibuki, sort of trying to chase the Iowa and the Edinburgh who are now pushing towards C. But um, it's it's he's doing it in a really awkward way. And like I said, the, the, t the enemy that, that went to C, they all pushed up in a very splintered fashion and that has definitely worked in NC Carolina's team's favour. So I sped up this bit because um, the, the the small group of enemies that uh, pushed up around the west side of those islands, I think maybe to come and try and help out with, with C. I mean, they weren't trying to directly pressure B, but um, they've chosen to come in through in an awkward way and Maybe they've just forgotten N. Caroline is here, and maybe they've just forgotten that he's got torpedoes, but he does. And, of course, this being a British cruiser, he can drop them all one by one. And so you can get very tight spreads. Now, his first spread is very tight, and then his second spread, he kind of waves them around a little bit. But it's not going to matter, because the first spread was certainly good enough. And if the Degrossa had Hydro, I don't think he was using it. So the second spread turned out to be unnecessary. The smoke drop turned out to be 
unnecessary and he might come to maybe regret that. He does get to use the smoke a little bit, but um, compared to his earlier smoke drops, compared to his first two smoke drops, uh, this one was a bit of a waste. And it's maybe just the fact that he was sat there broadside to the battleship. Just the instinct to smoke kicked in, whereas, um, of course, taking just a little bit longer, may have noticed that uh, the battleship was not pointing his guns at him. And of course, he just then ran straight into those torpedoes anyway. So that was a huge chunk of damage and uh, a useful kill, because the De Grosse is quite a tough ship. The Ibuki, meanwhile, has just been trailing all the way up to sea. Um, he's sort of now in a position to be useful-ish, but not really. And Carolina's team are now, uh, meanwhile, more or less sort of concentrated in this one spot, apart from the Fletcher who went down to Cap A. And that means they've now got all three caps. So they've got that ticking advantage going for them, if they can manage not to all die. So the Iowa did a, a drive-by. Uh, I don't quite know how he managed to do it. And there we go. This Targo's looking pretty right. Unfortunately, a bad thing is about to happen. A fun and engaging thing, in fact. Now, the Otago is uh, obviously dropping torps. It's actually a Takao, or however you say that, which is why it looks like a naked Otago. For some reason, in, um, in replays, even if in your port you have all of that turned on, you know, the Dragon ships and the ARP ships, it doesn't matter. In replays, it just shows us the, like, Miyokos or whatever. So, um, unfortunately, yeah, that's the fun and engaging bit. <laughs> His uh, division mate gets detonated, but possibly he would have died to the torpedoes anyway. And then, having just killed Itago, he gets the Colorado with burning? What? Just an instant before uh, he... I mean, it looked like the shells were connecting, it looked like the shells got the kill, but it was in fact his secondary setting the Colorado on fire, and then the ticking fire damage uh, that got him that kill, and the double strike, so he got a close quarters. Um, sort of, but not really, because it was the fire that got the kill. So that was a bit of a, a, a funny one, getting a fire kill with a, an Amer uh, not American, <laughs> what? <laughs> with a British cruiser. It is possible, it's just, you have to be pretty close to do it. So, the, uh, the Iowa, they did the drive-by between two enemy battleships and lived. Um, he's taken a turn and, and is now coming up back through B, but this leaves... Um, uh, in Carolina in a little bit of a tricky position and he's done his best to limit the amount of stuff firing at him. There's only two enemies left so um, using that island he can block the enemy Amagi from uh, getting any shots and uh, just concentrate on the Ibuki. But this is the point I suspect where having that smoke left would have been really useful. But we do have to bear in mind that, of course the Ibuki has got torpedoes. So yeah, it would have been useful, but he would have had to be prepared to get out of that smoke pronto, if need be. He's put out torps. I mean, I think this is not a favourable angle for launching torps or something. I think he knew they probably weren't going to, but it's a case of, well, you might as well. If the Ibuki straightens up a bit, he can hopefully take this guy. He's losing a fair bit of health, though, to those 8-inch uh, guns. Ooh, that, yeah, that's nasty. Uh, he doesn't have any... Uh, uh, health available back for another 25 seconds or so but fortunately that's not too long now this part here not entirely sure if that was intentional um, if he was trying to avoid turning and giving a broadside to the Ibuki and hoping that it at least gets some bounces now the Ibuki possibly was putting torps out there not sure um, there's enough distance and there we go he gets the kill fortunately and immediately punches the repair when that fire gets set um, but, yeah, that was awfully close, and if the Ibuki did put out torps, there's a good chance that, that uh, N. Carolina will uh, avoid them, because uh, he... Uh, generally speaking, when people are trying to do that, like they'll, they'll assume that you've run aground, you're not going to move, and they'll put out the torps accordingly, but in this case, no torps. Now, that must have been a hairy moment when the Amagi came around, but he actually fired, I think, at the Iowa, and so... And Carolina at least had the grace period of a reload to try and maneuver his ship around, and he's also gotten all of his torps out. So he just has to have to has to live for long enough, just long enough. And there we go. The shots were in the air, but the torpedoes got there first. So, all in all, I, I think that was more awkward towards the end of that battle. 
this is sort of the theme of this video, awkward ends to battles. In this case, um, a monster amount of damage, 257, with 7 kills and over 3,000 base XP. And I think he did use his smoke, especially at the start, um, in quite a, a tactical manner. Like that, that's how you want to, 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 to use your smoke in, in British cruisers, is to put yourself in a position where you can fire and, and do the most damage to the most amount of enemies, potentially. But then, of course, he wasted that one smoke charge, and it would have come in so useful at the end there. But as it was, he got away with it. Even if he died, I suspect they still would have won, uh, won even. The Fletcher was high health, and they had the Iowa with uh, a reasonable amount of health as well. So it, him dying wouldn't have been the clincher or anything, unlike the first battle. But it was still awfully tight, even so. Lastly, as promised, a destroyer game, and we're back down to tier 6 with the newly, well, newly-ish, re-minted, re-branded, re-somethinged, had Saharu, which of course previously was at tier 7. Now this is the one that leads eventually to the Akizuki. I have to be careful to get that right. Stupid confusing just Japanese destroyer names. Uh, although having said that, um, like the Royal Navy was pretty bad at that as well. There were two classes of uh, cruiser called the Town Class, and there were two classes of battleship called the King George V class as well. Yeah, I, I don't... Did, did we not have any other kings that we could name them after? I don't know. Anyway, so, never mind, that was just a random little aside. Uh, the Hatsa Haru these days, tier 6, it's not bad, uh, but for a supposed gunboat, it's not very gunboaty. As I noted at the time when doing the, uh, oh, hello. Oh, hello, Gator. Yeah, that looks like it might be good. Um, has a pretty slow torps, but even so, he was sailing right into those, and there it is. Anyway, yes, what was I saying? Yeah, for a supposed gunboat, it's not very gunboaty. You, you had with the Japanese destroyers uh, when they were all rejigged, as they're doing fairly soon with the uh, the Russian destroyers now as well, uh, where once upon a time you had a choice of hulls, uh, they essentially took the choice of hulls away from you. And so uh, it was possible to play the Hatsuharu with a little bit more gun, uh, firepower. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, but now it's not. I might be wrong about that though. It's definitely true for some of the Japanese destroyers where you, you went from having the option of a, a being a sea hull to effectively only having the sea hull and uh, so thereby losing a gun over what you had previously. Now in the case of the Hatsu it's not so bad but yeah uh, you are still reliant more than anything else on your torpedoes to do damage. So he's already had one nice kill with that uh, enemy destroyer getting knocked out. And the fact that it was the uh, hydro carrying destroyer was especially useful. Uh, oh, hello Leningrad. Yeah, a couple of seconds later, that could have been uh, nasty. But a couple of second la uh, seconds later, I don't think he would have uh, dropped those torps. So the Leningrad's come in to share his smoke. Um, you, somebody actually asked, by the way, the... the smoke counter mod on the bottom left hand side of the screen does not work in replays so just kind of ignore that um, but it tells you at least in the replays how long the smoke lasts for as a maximum it just doesn't count it down as the smoke is going in the replay anyway talking of the smoke going it has he's now spotted and so we've got to get out of here they've made an attempt at capping this this middle cap uh, they've got either side, but there is a lot of the enemy on the other side of this uh, this cap circle. It's a bit hot to hang around in a Japanese destroyer when you're just constantly spotted. And so he decides that discretion is the better part of valor and gets the heck out of there. Now there's a lot of his own team here as well, of course, but just glancing at the minimap, it seems like uh, the enemy has probably an advantage in terms of the amount of firepower they can they can bring to bear on any one target now not that they are all focusing on one target of course uh but for the uh larger slower ships around me there's uh, what is that a bayern there it's hard to tell with the minimap on the uh the, the, the preview window but he looks like he's probably getting a lot of attention of course there's torpedoes coming through there's lots of he coming through there's a carrier in play so uh it's uh, oh so koenig okay so life's a bit tricky 
There's also a Belfast who probably was using smoke and firing as well, and the two Russian destroyers. So, um, yeah, they, they just seem to have been forced back. And so that makes life a bit tricky, especially if they're going to lose a battleship in the process. They've actually already lost... Uh, is that two battleships? I wasn't really paying attention to... I was so busy wa waffling on about um, turrets and things. Uh, <laughs> Somehow they've lost two of their own battleships and I didn't even notice. So it's not off to a good start. And this one's going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to be one of those games. But this goes back to what I was saying earlier with the Dunkirk replay. It is sometimes possible to come back from what looks like a very bad situation. You might look at the points and think, well, that's going to be a win or a loss for sure. And then somehow enough people tenaciously hang on or there's enough low health enemies around or just some circumstance occurs where actually no it's possible if, if everybody does the right things at the right moments. So he's got a bit of damage under his belt, he's got a kill which is not bad, it's better than most of his team so far. In fact he's got the only kill of his team so far which maybe bears pointing out. There is a kamikaze running around behind the lines, though. And um, in theory, somebody you know needs to go and do something about it, but the Leningrad is much better placed to. And so I think having looked at the minimap and seen what is where, Hilti has, this, ha has at this point decided that going for the cap is probably the easiest thing because there's nothing that can immediately get there and decap. There is, however, a bit of enemy carrier presence over on this side. So that could be tricky. Now, as it's a Japanese carrier, the uh, torpedo bombers are more of a threat than the dive bombers. But that all, at the end of the day, comes down to how good the carrier player is. Because in principle, the Japanese destroyers are among the easier ones to take out with torpedo bombers, if you know what you're doing. But in this case, um, well, Hilti is sticking like glue to this Belfast right now. He's actually got his own AA turned on as well. And although the... Uh, hello! <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure of those torps he, he shot off earlier, I'm pretty sure they just hit the buy -in that went into B. So that was a nice bit of bonus damage. Um, but anyway, yeah, the Belfast doesn't have defensive AA, but just having cruiser AA next to him, um, that made the difference, especially as it's tier 6 carriers in the Belfast in that situation, uh, facing lower tier carries is actually quite reasonable. So he's clearly looking to make a drop against this uh, Congo, but then decides rather than try and position himself so he can do that, which would be very awkward through that gap in the islands, he lays down some smoke uh, to uh, create a, a, a cover across that gap. I, I'm not sure why he, he kept going so fast through the smoke. I mean, he kept him spotted a bit longer, but it's it's I suppose it's paid off in that it's a bigger smoke cloud. So if the carrier decides to come and drop random torps through it, he's got a much better chance. Whereas if it was one smoke blob or two smoke blobs, that's a lot easier for a carrier to just blind drop. Anyway, so having capped, he then decides to peek, maybe try and get a drop on that Congo. And, uh, well, he's going to be in for a little surprise. Because not only was there the Congo and the Nagato was spotted going this way earlier on, but hello, there is in fact the carrier himself. And there's the Nagato. Now, the Nagato and the Congo, having come to this particular bit of the map, have put themselves in a particularly useless position. So although, looking at the victory points, it might seem that uh, the enemy team has a pretty decisive lead at the moment. Hildebrandt's team has lost a lot of ships. Um, two very important components... Um, uh, the, 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 the two battleships are, are both here in a fairly useless position and, well, Hildebrand is up in the face of this independence, except he's kind of screwed this up a bit. He's put out both sets of torps and he is going to get one hit. But that was hardly a decisive knockout blow. And now he's got an angry carrier trying to kill him and the Nagato. Now the, the Congo's there as well, he doesn't immediately have shots from his position, I don't think, but this suddenly turned into a far more awkward fight than it needed to be. Now, if he, I think if he'd put out one drop 
force the independence to turn and then put out the other drop. But I, I, maybe, I mean, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because I frequently screw up in warships myself. Um, just the, the sheer, not panic exactly, but the unexpectedness of seeing the, the carrier and then knowing that there's destroyers there, knowing that you're going to, uh, not destroyers, uh, battleships rather, and that you're going to be permanently spotted and that they're going to be shooting at you and that the carrier's going to be shooting at you. Um, yeah, it, it's not the easiest to stay entirely calm, cool and collected under those circumstances. And so he's just in this really super awkward position of sailing next to this guy who fortunately I don't think has to, uh, no, the, the Independence doesn't have any defense guns and um, having to wait for his torpedoes to reload. So the carrier's done, and that's great news. But now he's still perma spotted by those planes, which might have been an issue anyway. He will have smoke in about 30 seconds. But his best bet is just to get out from under the planes if... Uh, it was one squad left as well, but his AA just couldn't quite kill it. So, um, yeah. If he can get away from being spotted, he can maybe do something with these battleships. And... The remaining, uh, one of the remaining enemy ships, uh, the destroyer rather, turned up in B as well, but he just got knocked out by that Ognivoy, who was very low health. Talking of low health, yeah, he's lost a couple of hit points there himself. These enemy battleships, by the way, I have no idea what they were doing. And um, despite 100% being aware of Hildebrandt's presence, do you think that Congo decided that it would be a good idea to take evasive action in case there was torpedoes in the water? No. Sailed in a nice straight line right into Hildebrandt's torpedoes. And suddenly, well, they're back in the lead. Now, they did lose ships elsewhere on the map. Uh, their own carrier is dead at this point. They've got, what was it, uh, a Leningrad and a Gneisenau and this Nagato. And they are in control of you know, two-thirds of the count points. They're well ahead in points. And suddenly, this went from being at, what, one point, something like 200 points to 700 they're now at 700 to just under 600. So it's close, it's tight, but it's definitely swung back in their favor. So that, uh, that lot of tops you put out, I mean, the, the Nagato paying a little more attention than the Congo. And uh, with all three cap points, they just have to not die at this point. They just have to not die and they can win when it gets to a thousand. The biggest threat of the enemy ship still left alive is probably the uh, the Leningrad. Now, I don't know what health his remaining allies are. Everybody that's left alive at this point is a destroyer. And Hildebrandt himself is counselling them to just stay alive. They have the points advantage. And if you can uh, knock out this Nagato, then that will bring victory even closer. So, he's about to be spotted, I think. That's why he... I, I don't know... I mean, about 6.6. .6. I don't know what captain skills he had on this. I, I can't say offhand. I can't remember offhand what the, the concealment is with uh, with paint and the, the captain skills. But, um, I mean, it's not it's not that great. Um, and it's close enough to drop the torps. But also, in order to get to a position to drop the torps, I mean, he's had to drop smoke. He's had to give his position away. And so the Nagato is going to know there are torps in the water. And they're not the fastest torps in the world. So the question is, well, no, he doesn't get the kill, but he does get a bunch of extra damage. So, uh, yeah, the Nagato just didn't quite manoeuvre in time. I don't know. But uh, as, as long as Hildebrand can stay alive, that's the main thing. I think he's very tempted to go after this guy, but with the health he's got, it would be incredibly risky. And he's pushed his luck enough already. So the smoke goes and he pops out pretty much within detection, um, which is not great, but the guy didn't have guns pointed his way. However, they win on points because uh, I think the enemy Leningrad got knocked out as well as uh, the, last, uh, the other remaining enemy battleship. So it was basically just down to that Nagato. So 152k uh, damage. 2,600 base XP and a very, very awkward end to that game once again, but it worked out. Sometimes these very, very awkward games do work out. Uh, not not everything in life or World of Warships goes smoothly, and it's, it's just, you know, any game that you can win, any game that you walk away from, and especially if you can take that awkward situation and... and uh, 
do quite a lot of damage in it or whatever. But um, yeah, but for those enemy battleships not being particularly good players, and uh, if the uh, the uh, the independence uh, did I say it was Japanese carrier? It was an independence, clearly not a Japanese carrier. But um, yeah, the independence was um, uh, I, I don't know, like. It, it was all just very, very awkward, and Hildebrandt kind of messed it up a little bit, but uh, recovered quite nicely in the end there. So, uh, hopefully this was a, a good episode. It's quite a long one, uh, which is one of the reasons why it took longer to do. Um, but also, um, this I've, I've hit one of those periods that happens sometimes where just everything comes about uh, becomes about 300% more difficult, including speaking out loud. Which, you know, you know how good I am at that normally. But, uh, yeah, hopefully I can keep some semblance of, of regular videos going out over the next little while. But um, I don't know. I can't promise anything just because uh, I'm not feeling 100% myself. And also there's the, the Russian destroyers to test out. We've got the uh, the ranked games going. We've got a new Russian premium destroyer to go with the new Russian uh, or the, the reject Russian destroyers. And then of course there's the USS Black. The reward which is um, everything that the Flint you know, all, all the complaints about the Flint but kind of turned up to 11. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a bit busy. I might just, I don't know I might put my head down and try and concentrate on playing warships and just aim for a video every other day or something so um i don't know what it's going to mean for the video upload schedule but you know i will i'll, I'll, I'll try and not there uh, not let there be any just massive gaps because sometimes when i'm not feeling great i just grind to a sudden halt and uh, there's you know a, a week or two weeks go by with nothing uh, so um yeah it might be a bit patchy but i'm going to try and keep videos going all the same so hopefully you've enjoyed this and if you have you can leave any comments below you can hit the like button, you can sub to my channel if you haven't already, and as always, stay tuned for more.